Hey guys, and welcome to the next edition of Tackle Hacks. In this edition, it's going to be more of a tackle tip, if you will. Um, and this one was inspired by a question that we just uh, had, a, had an opportunity to read here in one of the kayak bass fishing uh, groups on Facebook. And it's just, it's a, it's a great question. It's something that I've been uh, noticing and had to adjust to quickly. And what this was, um, there's a user there that posed uh, the the question um, in the form of kind of a statement that uh, his favorite go-to lure has always been that of like soft plastic worm, a Senko of some kind. And he's just been noticing that now that he's in a kayak, his hook up ratio, his hook sets, he's been having a challenge with. Um, and we noticed this, uh, like I said, this transition from bass boat to kayak, I noticed it uh, immediately Um just as as a product of of being kind of dialed into to a lot of our equipment and and different techniques, but I wanted to kind of go over some basics with this and a little bit some uh, some intermediate uh, information as to what can help you uh, if you're coming from the bass boat into the kayak world or if you're new just to kayak fishing in general. Um, there's some there's some things at play here that you need to keep in mind. Um, I have said to several people that uh, I can firsthand. Uh, attest to the fact that fishing for bass out of a kayak will exploit uh, skill and equipment deficiencies. And what I mean by that is these things have to be, you, you can get away with a few things a little bit more from the, from the deck of a bass boat than what you can inside of a kayak. Uh, certain things in the kayaking world require you to be a little bit more dialed in if we're talking about that upper end uh, of the of the spectrum, such as what I, what I mean by this to to kind of explain to this is hookup ratio, um, hookup percentage. You know, if you're out wreck fishing or if you're out just having a good time, you know, you swing on one and you miss. It's not a horrible horrible deal, right? I mean, yeah, it hurts, it kills. We never want the big one to get away. But it's not the same that when, you know, literally a quarter inch or a half inch separates you or ounces separate you from cashing a check after you've spent, you know, a couple thousand dollars getting to an event. At the tournament level, every little, you know, ounce, every quarter to half inch counts when you're out there. And it can mean the difference between you having a, a an okay or good or great day, uh, you know, as it it literally in a, in a split second. So we work very hard as tournament anglers to eliminate the variables that we can, right? And so this topic that this uh, gentleman is is encountering falls right in that, but it also is applicable to to just going out, you know, and taking somebody out fishing there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this here. And what we're talking about is hookup ratio. The, again, this gentleman was noticing that with his Cinco's, he wasn't getting as good a hook set uh, from the kayak as what he was getting. And uh, he was just kind of curious if anybody else had encountered this and, and just trying to get some advice on, on what's going on. So to get into that topic here, we're going to talk about some of the, 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 the physics basics here, and then I'm going to take you down to the garage and you're going to have to bear with me. It is a, looks like a bomb went off in there as we've been trying to get our uh, unlimited ready to go for next week's all American. Um, we literally are three to four days out before we leave. So we are working feverishly to get everything loaded up the way we want it. So we can go to Truman reservoir and have a good showing. So the physics of what we're talking about here, it's important to kind of break this thing down. And, and again, I'm going to grind this down into some details uh, that you may or may not be interested in about your, your hookup ratios, but hopefully it'll give you some background here. Think about first and foremost, the action of setting a hook from your boat. You have your boat positioned, your fish is here, 
you're either sitting in a chair, you're standing on your deck, um, fishing boat, whatever you're, you know, deep V doesn't matter. You set the hook on said fish. Fish begins to fight and moves. Think about the weight of your boat. Think about the displacement, what's going on there, comparatively speaking to the fish. Now flip that. Think about your kayak in the water. The difference that you're going to notice here is that the weight and physics taking place of what kind of displacement you're making with a kayak is very, very different than what you're displacing with a boat out there. Therefore, the physics we're talking about here is the pull factor, right? It's that initial set piece. Um, one of the things that we've noticed and that you will notice when moving over to the kayak world is upon the hook set, the kayak's going to move. Okay. It is, it can move across that water much easier and can be moved around with wind. Um, you're going to have to pay closer attention to the slack that's in your line. Um, I know a lot of guys uh, get, get really hung up on the, on the slack piece, but I think that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of one oh one, right? We're, we we're taught how to pay attention to the slack in our line from if we're float fishing or, or whatever. But the difference here is that in a kayak, it can adjust on you much faster, more subtly, uh, just because of how much, uh, you are, you are able to, you know, get moved around by the wind or by current or whatever in a kayak comparatively speaking to that of a boat. So upon that hook set, you may not have as much leverage when you're first initially setting the hook or the moment you set the hook, the kayak will move with you. The moment that the fir the fish first gets hooked up, may he may not be fully pinned yet. And that movement there can actually create that slack that is needed for them to, to shake and spit the bait out. So you got that going on first and foremost, and it's important to, to keep that in mind. So the way to counter that, in my opinion, is twofold. First, hone your technique. There are many different types of hook sets you can do. And usually for me, it's usually based on the type of bait and situation that I'm in. Um, the more exposed hooks, the less you need to, and the less you want to really whale back on that rod, fishing rod, uh, such, such as crank baits uh, or things of this nature. Um, you just don't need to do that. And you actually run a risk in most of those cases of bending those hooks more than anything, uh, just because they're a finer wire usually. Now, there are always exceptions to the rule on this. Um, but I'm going to give you, uh, again, we're just going to go over some of the generalities. So there's different techniques of hook setting. There's sweeping hook sets. You can just simply reel back into them. Um, you'll notice a lot of times on spin casting gear, guys just simply reel up and just, you know, load the rod up at that point because that tiny little drop shot or little Ned rig is a super fine wire and it doesn't take much to penetrate and for it to go through in reverse. You have big jigs. They have real big, thick wire on those jigs, or you have Texas rig with your Senkos or your creature baits or whatever that have very big punch hooks on those. And you need to, when you set that hook, you need to drive it hard enough so that it penetrates through the plastic and then into the fish's mouth uh, on the inside there to pin them. Okay. So that's the first piece that you can control is, is, is make sure you're doing the appropriate hook set, you know, for the, for the bait that you're using. Uh, out there. Uh, again, my general rule of thumb is, um, the more exposed hooks that a bait has, the less I need to horse back on it. Okay. You still obviously want to, want to make sure that you're either sweeping. I know for me personally, like on crank baits, I set up so that my hook set in most cases can be to the right, just because I reel left on either bait cast or spin cast. And my right hand is what holds the fishing rod. So for me, I feel like I have more control when I set back like so, when I come back this way. So I can just simply lean into it. I'm checking my surroundings, make sure I'm not gonna step on rods and reels and everything on my deck uh, of the boat. Now on a kayak, I'm simply looking for clearance. I need to envision which direction the hook set's gonna go. So I have to work to get better on my, if you will, my backhand, so to speak, uh, you know, rolling hook set like that. Thankfully in my new canoe unlimited, uh, I have a fusion, uh, 360 fusion seat. So it rotates. So I can literally rotate my entire seat with the hook set if I need to, and still keep my shoulders, you know, nice and, uh, center line down there. So, um, it offers me a little bit more freedom with that. Um, 
So nonetheless, that's the first piece here is really hone and look at your hook sets when you're out there, what type of hook sets you need to do, and just look at how much throw you're going to have. That will help you determine what kind of reel down you need to do to get that slack out of the line to really get a good hook set in there. Okay. Um, so nevertheless, that's, these are the pieces that you can work with. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the garage because equipment can really, really help you in this case. And what I mean by equipment are number one, understanding what bait you're throwing, your fishing pole and your fishing line. Okay. Those two things can absolutely help increase your hookup ratios. Okay. There, it's something that we, we live by in the tournament world, be it boat or kayak. You need to understand the the type of equipment you're choosing to throw the type of bait uh, that you have out there and see is are you using the right equipment to help you or to hurt you when it comes to these hook sets nobody's seen i mean you can literally catch a fish on a stick and string but if you're looking to increase percentages and you're looking to make sure that the tools you're using are correct there's a few things to consider so without further ado let's head down to the garage we're going to go take a look at some stuff All right, guys, welcome to the garage down here. Again, it looks like a bomb went off. I apologize. Any background noise you're going to hear? The wind has been crazy here in Colorado. Um, we got stuff. We live in a new subdivision, so I got stuff blowing all over the place. At any rate, if you were looking for quick explanation uh, on this whole hookup uh, ratio piece or this hook set issue, um, this is not the video for you because I want to make this uh, beneficial to beginners, beginners in fishing, beginners kayak fishing, all the way to uh, advanced guys that are coming over to the kayak world from the bass boat uh, uh, world as well. That there are a lot of things. Now in the first part we covered the physics piece, understanding that when you hook set from a kayak your, your boat's actually going to move a little with that. So paying attention to that slack is going to be huge. And this is going to be applicable this information i'm about to give you it's going to be applicable whether we're talking spin casting or bait casting okay uh, nevertheless let's get into this man let's grind this thing down let's talk about the equipment what we're dealing with and what your choices should be uh, as an angler or at least should be pointed in and to preface this whole thing as usual there is never a 100 percent absolute uh, explanation to this stuff that is going to carry across the board. Okay. There's always going to be exceptions to the rules and there's always going to be, you know, different areas here found out by different anglers. Okay. That's, that's a given. We know that. Um, what I'm going to try to give you is basically some of the things that you have in play out there that can help you fine tune. If you're looking to even by 1%, right? I mean, one of the things we did in coaching all the years that I, I was a coach, that 1% gain, man, that's what we're looking for. And that's what you can do. These are variables and things that you can control. When you get comfortable with a setup and you get that confidence in a setup, man, there's nothing more powerful than that, especially in, in tournament fishing. Get that confidence built into it. And then when you want to make adjustments, make small adjustments, okay, as you, as you move forward. That way you can kind of see what adjust you know what what variations are starting to take place so enough of all that let's get into this man let's get into some of the gear so the first thing i want to cover uh, when we're talking about hookups specifically we're going to answer the question here when we're talking about senko worms uh in general uh senko is a brand stick worms plastic worms okay my plastics i get come from tackle hd absolutely love the soft plastics it is the perfect balance of durability and flexibility it gives me a lifelike uh, appearance when we're dropping through the water but yet they they can hold up multiple fish i'm not you know blowing through a bag of them in, inside of an hour and a half tackle hd um bada bing yep i'm plugging them uh these are the the the, the companies i trust in uh, in banking on to help make me money uh, when i'm out there so Soft plastics, we're going we're gonna to basically venture with that. Before we get too far in there, let's talk fishing line. Okay, Fishing line matters when it comes to your hookup ratios, and here's why. First thing we're going to talk about, monofilament. Okay, This is the fishing line your grandpa used and everybody used out there, um, although this vicious ultimate uh, 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 mono is obviously uh, not the same as the old stuff that's out there, but it is monofilament line. Its construction is there. Monofilament line floats. Okay, that's the first thing. This has a tendency to be buoyant. It wants to stay on top of the water. Second factor that you need to remember about monofilament line, it stretches. 
Okay, when tension gets put on there, it's going to give way and it's going to stretch. All right. Now, that can hurt in regards to uh, memory online and so forth that's out there. But in our case here, just remember that when I hook set, monofilament will have a tendency to give, okay, on its hook set when the tension really gets heavy on there. This is 10 pound test, so it wouldn't take a whole lot to get that to stretch. A lot of guys out here in Colorado fishing with six pound, eight pound, won't take much to get that line to stretch. Okay, so remember that monofilament, the most stretchy. Next in line, middle of the road when it comes to the stretchiness, fluorocarbon. Vicious Fishing uh, Pro Elite fluorocarbon. This has less stretch than mono, but it has a little bit more than the next step up, which is braid. Fluorocarbon also has a unique feature in the fact that it does not float. Okay, it will sink. Um, it doesn't have near as much buoyancy in its, in its chemistry of this. But when I hook set with fluorocarbon, it's going to be much less stretching taking place in that. It's going to react faster and it's going to pull that bait quicker than what monofilament will. All right, so that's the basic piece there to remember with fluorocarbon. The least amount of stretch is in braid, okay, braided line. Your braided line has almost no stretch whatsoever. So the moment that I hook set and that rod loads up, Bang, it's pulling that bait, okay, and it's hammering it back fast. Now, it's important to remember those things when we're, when we're moving here. Also, the last thing, braid will float, okay, so it's a floating uh, bait. <clears throat> we'll be doing a different video as to what types of line we use for what applications, because I use all three uh, depending on the application that I'm, that I'm using out there, and that's why I love Vicious Fishing so much because they have top quality mono, floral, and braid uh, available to you at decent prices. So, enough, uh, another sponsor plug right there. All right, so those, th those factors become very important when we're talking about hookup ratios, okay? When we're talking about setting the hook and what's gonna increase our chances of getting that fish pinned. That's really what we're trying to do is when that hook comes up, it gets into the mouth of them and it pins them. It sticks into the mouth of them and they're not getting off, okay? That's what we're trying to go after. So you need to think about these things when you're throwing a certain type of bait. So let's go ahead and start with the stick bait that uh, this gentleman on the, um, KBF uh, Facebook group was talking about. Old Man Spectacle BC's on here. Most people, um, there's different types of hooks that you can set this thing up with. Uh, and what we're talking about is like a Texas rig of some kind. A Texas rig is very simple. Um, we're going to take basically a little 2 aught or actually 3 aught a uh, little wide gap hook here, EWG. We're going to set it up with a Texas rig. It's very simple. We come through the top. We bite it about yay far down. Okay, we're going to slide it up. It's going to come up onto this keeper. I like that's one of the reasons I like this this type of uh, uh, hook. It's got a nice keeper at the top. This is also a pretty thick wire. I'm doing that for the video purposes so you can see it real easy. Um, and that actually that thick wire also affects your hookup ratio depending on uh, your line choice at that point. So we'll get her down here. We'll punch her through. Now the important piece to always remember is to keep that thing as straight as possible. That allows for a lifelike presentation when it's coming down through the water. Also, when you're bouncing around there, you can also stay more weedless with this. But now, what is important about this here on your hookup ratio? You need to think about what's going on. What forces are in play? My line is attached here, coming up. When we feel the doink 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 on the end of the rod tip there. Or on our line, we are going to sit back and we are going to, you're going to see uh, guys out there that really horse that, that, uh, that hook set on this. The reason they're doing that is because you see what we did with this hook to keep it weedless. We have to drive that hook through the soft plastic and into their mouth. Okay. We have to pull this thing hard enough so that it's going to drive that hook up and through, bang, and get that fish pinned in there. Okay. So, with a non-exposed hook, this is where you're going to have to have the most horsepower in your hook set, okay? As a general rule, like I said in the first part, the more hooks exposed, the less horsing you have to do on the rod to get it to pin the fish, okay? The bigger the wire the hook, 
the more horsepower you're going to need to get that to pin because a bigger wired hook has a bigger point on it and it's not going to penetrate as quick and easy. Um, if you want uh, evidence to that, think fly fishing. Hook that is basically that big around can, you know, hook a fish my size and pull it right to the deal because it pins them so, so well it fires uh, fires in there and they use amazing materials in the, in the process. But our, in our setup here with a worm, if I'm using a, a Texas rig style and I've got a big thick hook, I'm going to need more horsepower to get that thing to pop through. Now, when we add in the other factors of sitting in a kayak, which means my boat's going to move, I need to pay attention to that, uh, to that slack. And then we need to start thinking about what kind of line am I throwing? Am I throwing monofilament because it's the most inexpensive and it's what I wanted to use? Okay, fair enough. Good. There's no, no qualms to that, but just know I've got stretch taking place in there. Therefore, I really got to reel that thing down and I got to make sure that the rod I'm using is supporting those other choices properly. Okay. I'm not saying you can't use, you know, a certain type of, of line or this. And that. I'm saying you can use anything you want. But if you're looking to improve your chances, you got to remember the things that are in play here. Okay. So that's the first piece. Now, let's look at the polar opposite of that. Let's say I'm throwing on the same rod and reel, throwing ourselves a crankbait. Now I've got two sets of trebles on this little square bowl here, and we got six exposed hooks. Remember my rule the more hooks exposed, the less you got to horse it. I get a bite on this thing, that fish comes up and kachomps on board that bad boy. I'm literally leaning back into it. I'm going to reel into it, a little sweeping hook set like that. All I got to do is get that tension uh, rolled up there quick enough and bang, we should pull him right in. He's going to pin himself. The only time you're going to have issues with that is if they're short striking it. That's what we mean by that. They're only biting towards the back. In which case, with a short strike, you don't want to jerk that pole super fast anyway. You want them to go ahead and hit that and get turned so that that hook has a tendency to hook back when you just reel and sweep into them. Okay. So those are a couple of the things, like I said, that we have in play. Now, when it comes to the hook piece, I, I want to do cover a couple more with that. So you see the, the size of hook we're dealing with there. There's also a different type of bass fishing hook that we use that is basically more of a worm hook, if you will. It's a more linear presentation piece, and you can see the difference here between the, the extra wide gap, if we get, the, get them up. You can see all that's going to do is basically just set in line. I prefer to use a lot of these worm hooks just because I believe when I pull on that hook, it helps crank and get that hook up into a good position. There are certain applications, however, when I'm really wanting uh, that extra wide piece, like when I'm punching grass or whatever. A lot of times I'll use more, uh, more of the extra wide because I want them to get, get on that and let that hook uh, come up and fire into there. Again, I want to emphasize with you that the wire gauge really has a lot to do with your line choices and uh, your hookup ratio. We'll see if we can see it here. This red hook I got just again for the video purpose. The wire, the red is a thinner wire. Okay. Now what's going to be important to that also to keep this in mind on your hookup ratios. If I've got say a heavy action braided line and I'm punching and I'm using this little red deal here, I need to keep in mind that there's a good probable chance I could bend this hook because I have more horsepower and I'm throwing, you know, 30, 40 pound braid. This little fine wire hook may not hold up to that as well. So I just need to keep that in mind. Does it mean you can't fish with it? No, absolutely not. You certainly can. But you just need to, again, remember what's in play, okay, with what, what you're choosing on this um, to, to fish. The ultimate, in my personal opinion, when it comes to needing horsepower to set the hook is in a punch hook, okay? This punch hook is real similar to a Texas rig. Um, it does offer some of the best punching ability when you rig it properly up there. It has a really nice thick keeper on it. Um, you're not going to get a lot of usage out of your soft plastics just because of that thickness and gauge that's going on there. But what we're talking about doing here is that we just basically punch about three quarter of the way through. And now I got a nice straight line presentation with the right knot set up here. The moment I pull back and hammer on this, that bad boy is going to basically punch through that worm and come firing up in, into there. Now, if you're throwing some light line with this, 
and a, on a say a, a light or medium action rod, you're going to struggle. Okay, I'm telling you that right now. You're going to need at least a medium heavy, in my personal opinion, and you're going to want some strong line uh, when you're throwing these punch uh, punch hooks like this. Um, it is just it, it like I said, it's just thick gauge, very durable, and it's meant for close quarter heavy combat when you're when you're down uh, down in those areas. We don't see a lot of usage. Uh, for this, quite honestly, here in Colorado, just because we don't have as many weeds and thick mats to punch um, where this would be required over something else. But some of the air, other areas that we fish, um, absolutely, these punch, uh, punch hooks are, are fantastic. So that's the piece when it comes to your hook selection and your line. Okay, so we've got that kind of kind of looked at here and gone over. Now, let's talk about, I've been dancing around this, let's talk about fishing rods. Um, what fishing rods are going to do and how they're going to react. There's two factors, uh, three factors that come into play with a fishing rod. Length, power, and tip. Okay, those are the things that you're going to look at. Length um, will have an effect on certain aspects. In regards to hookup ratios and settings, the only thing to remember um, that you want to keep in mind is that a long fishing rod is going to give you much more leverage to take up that line faster. But when we're talking about kayak fishing, sometimes the super long rods, those 7.6, 7 7.11s, 7 eight footers, those things just aren't practical, okay? Coming down in there, a lot of guys will say the longest they'll throw is like a 7.1 uh, or whatever. I do have a couple 7.6s that I throw on the, on the Unlimited. Um, my Unlimited has a tremendous amount of space in there. And so the way we've got it rigged up, I can get a couple of those. And those are my cranking rods. That way, I literally, for my sweeping hook sets, it's super simple. I just simply roll, you know, reel back into it, and bang, we got them pinned pretty quick. That's just me personally. Other guys can do the same effectiveness on a, on a 6.10 rod or a 6.6 rod. I'm sure they have just as good a hookup ratio. Um, again, like I said before, it's about what, what you're comfortable with and where you have your confidence. So let's look at what those other factors. So again, like I said, that length piece, um, from a kayak fishing standpoint, I personally think that the length comes into factor more from a bass boat in regards to technical advantage that you can do uh, in certain areas with punching, accuracy, things of that nature. I think in the kayak world, uh, the length really has a factor on, on uh, the biggest area is just the manageability, in all honesty, um, when it comes to you know being able to get it on there. I think that there are options in kayak that you can avoid uh, the necessity um, and gain just as much, you know, elsewhere without worrying about that. If that, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to explain there. So anyway, let's go ahead and talk about the next two things that do have a direct impact on your hookup ratios, power and tip. Remember what I said before, let's start with the high end, the horsepower hookup. Where we need that is when we're using soft plastics with thick wire, um, jigs that have big thick wire on them uh, that you're going to see big thick hooks that are meant to you know hold up and, and withstand you're going to want more power there on your hook set so let's look at first one we have here this bad boy is my pool stick if you will now I've got it rigged with 25 pound floral okay I use this for uh, a lot of my football jigs I want good strong floral carbon but I also want the this uh, the, the depth ability that, that floral gives me and the invisibility that floral gives me this rod right here is by uh, it's a, uh, a fate black by 13 uh, fishing this is a seven foot four heavy power extra fast tip what does that mean Heavy power references the blank. Heavy power means this is one of the strongest, and this thing is going to set up when I when I get into a hook set with this, and we hammer back on this. I'm going to have a tremendous amount of throw when it comes to the bait, uh, the the hook set, and also what kind of cover I can rip it through. Um, they tend to be heavier, okay? So not a lot, not a huge choice with a lot of guys. Um, once you're more comfortable with uh, these type of setups, for me personally, I have certain applications that a heavy is an absolute must. Also means I don't have to, um, I don't have to whip back as hard as if I was using, like, say, a medium or a medium heavy, because the heavy action blank is going to hammer into there super fast. 
the next piece that affects that, how quickly that blank engages and that, that power engages is the tip when we're talking about that. Um, briefly before we go on, you have heavy. There are some manufacturers that make extra heavy. Uh, you can get into some serious, like, like casting with a pool cue, man. You can get out there, broomstick. Uh, there's mediums, there's medium heavies, there's lights, there's extra lights. All have their purpose, again, about your comfort zone, what you have there. So in this case here, if I'm throwing Senkos or I'm throwing football jigs um, and I'm worried about covering things of that nature, then this bad boy right here is going to be my go-to in a lot of cases, this heavy action. Um, truth be told, I'll throw a lot of plastics on a medium heavy as well with the right tip. So let's move up to the tip. The tip, you're going to have ratings. Most manufacturers rate these tips on the speed. You're going to see extra fast, fast, moderate, uh, moderate fast. Um, those are probably going to be your most common ratings that you're going to see out there. And what it's talking about, if I can get this into the camera view, what it's talking about is the parabolic bend takes place on the tip before the main power of the rod is engaged. So an extra fast means there's going to be less bend up here and what's going to happen is the power of that heavy blank is going to engage at an extra fast speed, okay? It's going to hit into there super fast. Where in the reverse of that, a moderate tip is going to have more parabolic bend to it before the rod blank engages its power. So it's going to have a little bit more flex there. And there's good applications for all of these. This, again, is a heavy power extra fast tip. And what you're going to see is that there is not a lot of bend in that. I'm telling you, I mean, I'm already getting, the, the rod blank is already engaging at this point. So it's not gonna take much from me. That's what I was saying. I can get by uh, on some of the other issues coming out of the kayak by the fact that this heavy action, extra fast, uh, 13 uh, fishing fake black, when I set back on this thing, boom, I've got horsepower on that bait immediately. Okay, so my chances for hookup are going to be increased in that case. So what we're going to do is we're going to move to the middle of the range now. Like I was telling you before, I do a lot of my uh, soft plastic fishing with medium heavy. It's probably the most universal rod that you're going to find out there is a medium heavy. The one that we use for that, right here. This is my 13 fish, and this is a seven foot, I should put my spectacles back on. This is a medium heavy, um, seven foot two rod. This is the Omen. This is one of my new favorites here. The difference on this one though, this is a medium heavy blank, but it's got a moderate, uh, uh, let me see, is that a moderate or moderate fast? It's a moderate fast tip, okay? A moderate tip would have more of a parabolic bend. I'll show you that on the next one, but this is a moderate fast bend. Okay, so it's somewhere in between. This gives me some flexibility on the type of baits that I can use with this and still feel comfortable that I've got the right equipment for the right job. So not a ton of difference between the heavy and the medium heavy, just obviously a little bit uh, uh, lighter blank, uh, a little bit less power uh, when we're throwing on there, but still a medium heavy, probably the most universal uh, power that you, you, know, you want to start with. You can't really go wrong with a medium heavy in my opinion. But now let's look at the, the tip on this one. Remember, the first one we were looking at was an extra fast, and there was not much before we were engaged. But now you can see, if I can get this in the camera view here, there we go. We've got a lot of parabolic men, and right about here now, I'm starting to feel that rod blank starting to kick in. In here, not so much. Okay, and you'll feel it because you just feel that pressure on your hand. But there is a lot more parabolic bend taking place in this, this one here. I use this one for spinnerbaits, I'll use this one for chatterbaits, I'll use this uh, for square bills, um, anything where there's an exposed hook of some kind. Uh, another thing I'll use a moderate fast tip for is actually top water. Um, I like that little bit of flex taking place there because sometimes if I get too excited, as I yeah, love top water, man, it's a drug, I see that blow up take place, sometimes I'll, I'll set back a little too early. If I've got the right gear on here, it kind of is a little bit forgiving uh, in that case because I'm not really hammering that hook set home yet 
with a good flexible tip. And that moderate fast is the good, perfect blend between those two for me personally. So that uh, is, is taking place when I'm throwing with, uh, with certain type of baits. Um, crank baits, like I said, square bills, um, the chatter baits, spinner baits, uh, you know, anything along those lines where I want that little bit of flex. So when I'm leaning back into it and I'm reeling to it, it gives that slight bit of delay before that medium heavy blank, boom, engages there and gets that, get that, uh, the, the hook set and gets that fish pin. All right. The last one I want to show you here, this is actually, uh, my, from arc rods. This is the invoker pro <clears throat> one of my all time favorite, um, fishing rods, uh, for jerk baits. Uh, this thing here is like the, the perfect balance. Now, I'm going to put my spectacles back on to read this because I believe this is about a six foot. What is this? This is a six foot 10 for jerk bait fishing from the deck of a boat. It has a little bit shorter rod there and it allowed me to sit there and, and not slap the water, slap the boat with it where a seven foot two or three might that tip might get in the way. OK, this is actually a medium power. OK, so it's not a medium heavy. It's a little bit lighter blank uh, that's taking place here. Um, and this is what they have their action set up as regular. What that is equivalent to is moderate, okay? Um, again, you just need to learn the, the specifications for each rod manufacturer. The most common is the moderate, moderate, fast, um, fast, extra fast. You'll see that mentioned most uh, more than not. Um, this one here, if I can get the line off of there, there we go. This one here, you're going to notice, has the most parabolic bend. Oop, I'm stripping my drag even, taking that up has the most parabolic bend out of any one that I've showed you. Right about there, I'm feeling the blank starting to kick in, okay? Now where that comes in super handy is in that jerk bait fishing because I don't need a ton of pressure. Usually I'm gonna have two sets of two treble hooks or three treble hooks sitting out on my, on my jerk bait um, that, I'm, that I'm throwing there at any given time. So really all I gotta do is get the right amount of tension on it and reel back into that and then just keep the, keep them pinned keep that tension on there the whole time and you're gonna you're gonna land that fish uh, with very little problem this is the invoker pro six foot ten um again it's a it's the medium uh with regular action it is basically specifically for their jerk bait it is a 40t um carbon nanofiber tubing uh, on this bad boy it's one of my all-time favorites uh, I formerly used to used to be with ARC, and I still have a ton of ARC rods uh, on deck uh, that I still trust and utilize out there. For the price point, it's one of the one of the better jerkbait rods, in my personal opinion, out there. It's tough to beat uh, the quality that you get from this thing. This thing is two seasons old for me, um, and she's still running like a champ. I clean her every year, and it's still rolling. So, anyway. So there you go. This is the equipment kind of breakdown that we've been talking about. Again, you can get away with anything, okay? I mean, you can literally uh, fish with, with a stick and string, man, and catch them. I did as a kid. Uh, I know pretty much a lot of guys watching this uh, did the same thing. But if you're looking to improve chances and you're making that transition over, you need to keep these things in mind when you're selecting the type of rod, fishing line, techniques, things that you're using out of a kayak. As I said in the opening sequence, I have learned coming from the bass boat world over to the kayak, kayak bass fishing exposes a lot of skill deficiency and some equipment deficiency. It really brings it into the light. So you have to be thinking on this stuff and, and give yourself the best possible chance. Um, if it's not that big of a deal to you, don't sweat it. Not, not real big. But if it is something that you're looking to improve your chances, your tournament fishing, you understand that ounces and inches and quarter inches and half inches separates between you and a check, you and a great day, or you and a really bad day, then you need to keep these factors in mind when you're out there. So uh, as a general rule of thumb to leave you with, the more hooks, the less horsepower I need to hammer back. Uh, on these things uh, as a general rule. The the less hooks exposed, the more horsepower I'm going to need uh, to to basically set that hook and, and assure myself a good pinning of that fish. So I hope this information helps you guys. If you have your opinions, your comments in there, please throw them down there. As I said before, this is not the Bible <coughs> or the, the end-all, beat-all, <coughs> excuse me, 
choking here on camera. But it is some good tips that are going to help you improve your hookup ratios when you're out there. And again, as we said before, we want to share our experience coming from the, the bass boat over to our unlimited uh, kayak uh, that we're, we're working with here. Um, that way uh, we can help maybe uh, answer a few questions for some other guys that are considering doing the same thing. Always available for any of your questions, any of your comments. Love the support that you guys provide us here. We appreciate everything here. Uh, your support continues to help keep us doing the services that, that we love to do with our vets and first responders um, and our fishing programs and such. So, um, as always, guys, tight lines and be safe. And welcome back, folks. I hope that little segment there uh, gives you a little bit more information and helps you make some selections. Um, we do things a little different here when it comes to our tackle tips. You're never going to hear me say this is the only way to do something because I've, I've been around this business long enough to know and around fishing long enough to know that that's just never the case. Um, so, but the best way to do, like I said before, it's going to be about your comfort. It's going to be about your confidence and what you have. And if you know the factors in play, you can help kind of make those decisions for yourself. Um, as we can do general rules of thumb. You know, the, uh, when it, when it comes to, I can tell you what I do. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't necessarily mean it'll be, it'll work for you. Uh, so to answer that question specifically from our man, Roy there at, uh, the kayak bass fishing, uh, Facebook page, uh, if I'm throwing, uh, plastic worms and so forth, and uh, I'm having some hookup issues. I'm going to be checking my gear, checking my hooks, um, and maybe upping the power a little bit on the rod choice there uh, that you're going with, or uh, increasing the speed of the tip that I'm using on the rod. Um, this this applies for spin, all the end bait cast. It doesn't matter. So those would be things I would do. And again, uh, following a more of a scientific process, upgrade one of them at a time, in my personal opinion, and then you'll kind of see where you're where you're fine tuned you know comfort zone is at um the the downside not to go down this rabbit hole too far on this video but the downside to the heavier action big thick stuff is that you lose sensitivity uh, with that so sometimes detecting those very subtle bites becomes more tricky uh in those cases so obviously you want to you want to find that balance for yourself there so Listen, folks, we are going to wrap this up here. Thank you so much uh, for, for all the support and likes and shares. Again, I always try to remind you, at the very least, uh, that takes little to nothing for you to like, like a video, uh, share, subscribe, um, and, and you know, following us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Those are the three areas that we focus heavily on, and it does so much for us. Uh, the broader audience we can reach is just, uh, it increases our effectiveness for the nonprofits we work with, and of course, the supporting uh, sponsors uh, that make all this possible for us, such as New Canoe Vicious, uh, NACO, Tackle HD, those companies there that, that get behind us and help us do this, All Terrain Tackle, Blackfish, um, without them, we, we would be in a really, really bad situation. So improving our effectiveness with them through the likes, the shares, the subscribes, the follows. That is huge stuff. If you are interested in finding ways that you can help support us, uh, uh, supporting one of the charities that we work with, go visit their site and there will always be a donate button right there. If uh, one of those uh, missions or causes is very true and dear and near to you, each one that we work with has its own specialized area that we work in. Of course, uh, the Romans Warrior Foundation, uh, you can donate directly to us at the Romans Warrior Foundation, right from RomansWarriorFoundation.org. Help us keep the wall traveling around the country. That is a huge, huge education and honoring piece, uh, mobile memorial that we that we have. If you want to support the outdoor piece, uh, you can do that too. You can donate there and just tell them you want it to go right to the outdoor programs. Um, uh, another way, if you're if you're interested in looking at ways to kind of support everything we're doing here at the True Patriot uh, Outfitters and supporting all of uh, these to help us keep going, order uh, fishing tackle through our uh, through the TruePatriotOutfitters.com. Uh, that is a big big help for us. If there's something you want us to carry there that we don't reach, reach out to me, man. Maybe that's something we can work out. And we can figure uh, and get uh, get into place there um, and get it going. And uh, again, uh, folks, thank you so much for, for following us and uh, making all of this possible. So as always, folks, from the from the outfitters here, you folks, tight lines out there. And please, 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 with the with the increased traffic happening on our lakes and, and open water, be safe out there. Gotta call up. Fuck. One, two.